My name is Will Simonson, and for a long time I have been fascinated by the landscapes, ecosystems and cultures of southern Europe and other parts of the Mediterranean. Maybe it is because of the remarkable ways in which people and wildlife can sometimes live in such close harmony there. Areas such as the ones shown here in Spain and Portugal make up one of the most important biodiversity hotspots of the world, one that is on our doorstep, though often overlooked. The region around the Mediterranean is particularly known for the richness of its flora. A square metre can contain tens of species of flowering plant, like this fritillary. Much of that richness in plant diversity is associated with the ways in which people have lived on and from the land for thousands of years. For example, carving out terraces on this Portuguese hillside and harvesting products from its forests. This floor with a fish motif dates back to the Romans, but Mediterranean landscapes were being transformed long before the Roman period. Some of the historical forms of farming and forestry survive into the present and help maintain the mosaic of different habitats that supports so much of the region's fauna and flora. One of the best examples of this harmony of nature and people is the wood pasture systems of the Iberian Peninsula. In Portugal, these savannah-like landscapes are called montado, with scattered cork oaks and home oaks. An American geographer almost a hundred years ago wrote of them, If I wanted to be comfortably and permanently rich, I could ask for few more secure bases than the undisturbed possession of a few hundred acres of Portuguese land with a good stand of cork oak trees, yielding its crops of cork and pork, the pork made of acorns. The virtues of the Portuguese cork forests are quadruple, and they are almost perpetual. Quadruple, incidentally, refers to wood and forage for sheep and goats, as well as the cork and pork. The cork oak is a remarkable tree. Its bark is the cork used commercially in a range of sectors, including in the building trade and even the aerospace industry as a heat shield in rocket engines. However, its most famous and economically important use is as wine bottle stoppers, fueling a massive increase in cork farming from the 19th century onwards. The same properties that give the tree protection from fire and disease provide a material for human use unrivaled by synthetic alternatives. This image shows the characteristic orange trunk of a newly harvested cork tree, with the number indicating the year of the cork extraction, 2008 in this case. The harvesting is a skilled craft, needing care not to damage the living tissue of the tree and performed at a particular time of year and at certain tree dimensions. The cork regrows and is ready to harvest again from the same tree in about 10 years. In this way, the exploitation is highly sustainable. More so, it is in fact essential for the sustaining of these ecosystems. If the market value of cork diminishes, then it puts under threat this whole system of agroforestry. Any decline in the demand for cork also puts under threat a whole host of wildlife associated with these areas. Birds, including raptors and the hoopoe, shown here, as well as mammals, reptiles and amphibians, and insects. Perhaps the most iconic animal of all is one that no longer roams these Portuguese habitats. The Iberian lynx is the most critically endangered cat species in the world, and hangs on by the thread of a couple of tiny populations in Spain. Habitat destruction, road mortality, and the decline of its main prey, the rabbit, have all played a part in this tragic loss to the Portuguese fauna. As well as the open hunting areas, lynx require the denser vegetation of tall shrubland and woodland, and this is another kind of habitat that the cork oak provides in less disturbed and accessible areas. These denser copses of trees are also special areas, rare, multi-layered jungles of herbs, shrubs, vines, including this climbing birthwort, and trees. Refuge areas for a more specialist fauna and flora, sometimes relics of a more humid, pre-Mediterranean climate three to five million years ago. This is the beautiful Western Iberian peony, endemic to Spain and Portugal, and largely restricted these, to these richly wooded areas. I've been studying these denser woodlands in recent years, not just on the ground but also from the air. 
In particular, I've been using LiDAR data collected by this plane operated by the Airborne Research and Survey Facility of NERC. LiDAR is one of a number of instruments pointing out of the plane's fuselage and gathering information from large swathes of forest or other land covers. This schematic illustration shows how, as the plane flies along, the scanner sweeps from side to side, firing pulses of laser at very high frequency. The plane flies to and fro, and in this way a large area of ground can be covered, about 100 square kilometres in the case of this flight record. If you imagine these trees and bushes being part of the surveyed forest, they get bathed in laser light, and as the laser pulses intercept branches and leaves, the reflections are picked up by the instrument and timed to precision. During post-flight processing, these reflections are converted into relative heights, which are accurately positioned with the help of an onboard GPS and another unit that controls for the movement of the plane. In the case of a forest, one ends up with a data set that can be depicted like this, a virtual landscape, if you like, in which each point gives away the position of branches and leaves, as well as the ground. In my first study area in the Monchique Mountains of southern Portugal, I was interested to see whether LiDAR technology could tell apart the different types of forest that I could describe on the ground using conventional methods of recording the presence and abundance of flowering plants. The answer was that it could. I discovered that the different woodlands had different LiDAR signatures. That's to say, they differed significantly in their physical structure, particularly in the height and density of the vegetation below the tree canopy. This was enough for LiDAR to be used to tell apart and potentially map the different woodland communities. This is a rare species of woodland ragwort only found in Iberia. Unexpectedly, I found a relationship between the average height of all the vegetation LiDAR reflections and the diversity of plants such as this that specialise in forest environments. Using an average height LiDAR metric as an indicator of such areas, I trialled the mapping of forest conservation status showing areas of high, medium and low condition. These sorts of approaches are going to be increasingly necessary for monitoring the implementation of conservation policy and legislation. My research then took me on to another study area, the Los Acornicales Natural Park in Andalusia, Spain. Acornicales means cork oak forest in Spanish, and this park holds the largest continuous extent of such forest in the Iberian Peninsula and indeed the world. It's home to large populations of red and fallow deer, and deer hunting is an important part of the local economy. This colourful patchwork actually shows the different slope orientations of a range of hills in the park, and this is the same area showing the steepness of the slopes. In work currently in progress, I'm again using LiDAR to see how the structure and composition of the forests change according to this crumpled looking topography which can exert a dramatic effect on plant growth through modifying microclimate and drainage. I have been recording how this impacts on the stature of the trees and amount of understory growth. The relevance of this lies in making sharper predictions about the effect of future climate change and how this may interact with land use and wildfires, which are influenced by the building up of combustible fuels in the understory. This is just one example of the use of remote sensing technologies in forest ecology. They add value to conventional field methods, allowing us to extrapolate the results from plots to much larger areas and take a broader view of things. Such methods won't always be so specialist and expensive and in time promise to revolutionise the field of spatial ecology. Technologies such as LiDAR may seem a generation apart from the traditional forestry systems under our lens. The exciting possibility is for the new to help preserve the best of the old and in the case of Mediterranean landscapes, contribute to saving one of the world's jewels of biodiversity.